Um, this is a, um, an event organized by the International Group from the Linke, and we are trying to organize as much events as possible about the international with an international program. And today we're going to talk about the election in the United States that will be in some weeks. And for this, um, maybe it's interesting for you to read here the program for this month and for next month, also with a cultural events and cinema. And yeah, but today we will talk about just political things. And for this, we have invited uh, three people. They will, they are going to talk about uh, from different perspectives about the elections. We have first of all uh, Eric Lee who came here from London, will talk uh, about, the, um, about what's his strategy. And he's a Bernie Sanders supporter, but this time he says that it's important to vote for Hillary Clinton. He's uh, the founding editor from Labour Street. Start. OK. And uh, we also have a woman, Katie Brown, who's an She's a member from the Linke International, from our group, and she's studying in Berlin, and she's, she supports the Greens, and she thinks that, that this time uh, we, you have to vote for something new, and it's the opportunity to, take, to change the situation. And we are also waiting for Dr. Thomas Krieben, who's a, a, um, a, he works in the, in, in the institute from, from the Freie Universität and he supports Clinton but he's like in the middle of these two people because he says that maybe in some states it could be possible to vote for the Greens. And, so the, and we also have um, the um, uh, Americans aboard uh, supporting us here today, and I heard that they wanted to say something about the registration for the voting. We're doing voter registration here tonight. Alan Benson here at the table and at uh, the computer together with Eva, and it's always difficult to pronounce your last name. Uh, anyway, the two of them are really, you, can sit here in you this might room. say, professional people although they do this all on their own free will and do not get paid. Um, working for Vote from Abroad, making sure that voters can get registered. And I was just asked to tell you all, in case you have not registered to vote yet, and in some states it's already too late to register, but it's not too late to vote with an emergency ballot, if I get that correctly. It's not too late to request your absentee ballot if you're already registered, um, and there is a backup ballot later on, but it is too late in some states to register. So in some states, it's really cutting it very short. We just want to make sure that it's possible for all of you here in the room that you register and use your right to vote, or you'll lose it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we will start with the debate. But first of all, thank you very much. So now the people who are talking here will present a paper with their um, point of view about the elections, and they will send it to the link to the party, so that they they want they will have to read it. And 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 just one more detail: if you want to hear a translation, you can sit there at the corner, and there is someone who will help you all the time. And yeah, so thank you very much for coming and we'll start now with the discussion. Thank you, good evening. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Good, well done. Um, my name is Eric Lee and, and thank you very much for inviting me to come to Berlin. Any excuse to get here. Um, I'll introduce myself. My, my role in the Sanders campaign was I organized London for Bernie and I represented officially the Sanders campaign to Democrats abroad, globally. And I was a member of the Democrats abroad delegation to the Democratic Convention in Philadelphia, where I sat in the Credentials Committee. And in a sense, this evening, I am representing Senator Sanders, because I'm going to be the person who will say what Bernie would say. If Bernie were here, he would tell you, vote for Hillary Clinton. That's it. Um, he's not here, so I'll have to make a slightly longer case than that. Yeah. Bernie's um, 
view from the very, very beginning, he was open and clear from day one of the campaign that if he was not the Democratic candidate, he encouraged all his supporters to support the Democratic candidate. Even if that were that awful woman, Hillary Clinton. He didn't say that. He didn't say that awful woman. I'm improvising. Um, he took that view at a time when Trump was not even considered a serious candidate. And Bernie's view was that any Republican would be so awful that any Democrat would be better, even though Bernie himself was, of course, not a Democrat. But he understood the Republicans were such an awful party to begin with. Um, and I'm mentioning this because with Trump, that argument is a thousand times as strong. Because just as Bernie was no Democrat, Trump is no Republican. He's something different and new. Now, Bernie chose not to run as an independent, though his entire political life he run as an independent. This year, he decided he would not run as an independent, he as a Democrat, and chose to compete in the primaries. Um, let's not forget that Bernie did exceptionally well. I'm going to come back to this. I want to um, talk about the Democratic Convention and what happened there. So I was there, I saw it, and it seems like an ancient history. This election, every day of it, feels like a year. I mean, it's just never ending. It's horrific. And I don't even want to read the news headlines today, because God knows what's being said. But the Democratic Convention was only, you know, I don't know, two months ago, a barely. Um, Democratic Convention this year adopted the most progressive political platform ever adopted by a major political party in America, ever. It's a platform, I won't go through the whole list, but you probably know most of them. It, it, it raises the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour, makes it easier for workers to join and form unions, abolishes the death penalty, opposes these stupid so-called free trade deals, and so on. There are hundreds of these things. And these were all due to Bernie Sanders' efforts and our campaign. If Hillary Clinton had run unopposed, the, you know, the platform would be unbearably neoliberal and awful and all that stuff. Um, I have to emphasize, I fought against Hillary Clinton tooth and nail for more than a year. I campaigned and told everyone who would listen she'd be a terrible candidate for the Democratic Party. My candidate was Bernie Sanders. I still believe that's true. I think if Bernie was the candidate today, this would be a much easier race for us. The debates would be a lot more fun to watch. <laughs> but Bernie's not our candidate. And one of the extraordinary things that happened at the convention, and Bernie spoke about this a lot, was it's not just that the party adopted a platform that nobody is bound to, which is true. It's that Hillary personally committed herself to a whole range of these things. She, she didn't say, I don't, she, I don't think she said she supported the entire platform, but major parts of it which she had previously opposed, like debt-free college education or $15 an hour minimum wage, which she had always opposed, and you know, Bernie was a crazy socialist to propose such things, she now has embraced for her own reasons. Um, we were in Philadelphia, 45% of the delegates, we were not some fringe, tiny minority, we were practically half the room. Our campaign was not a failure, our campaign was a success. Because we got a democratic socialist candidate running on the most left-wing platform America's ever seen in a major party that close to winning the nomination. That close. One or two more victories in primary states of importance and Bernie would be the nominee. It didn't happen. In Democrats abroad, we won 70% of the vote globally, even higher here in Germany. 70% of Democrats living overseas didn't want them to, they want the Sanders. We are a very strong movement in the Democratic Party and our voices are being heard. Um, a word about Donald Trump. I'd rather not speak at length about Trump. My doctors advised against it. Um, <laughs> Donald Trump, <laughs> that actually wasn't a joke, but I'm no, um, Donald Trump is not Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney is a Marxist compared to <laughs> He's not John McCain. John McCain is a lovable buddy. Donald Trump is something utterly new and, uh, and awful to a, a degree which I hope you will understand. Um, if there are any Trump voters in the room, right now people really think Trump is a good guy and would like to vote for him, just please leave the room. <laughs> I, I mean, he's abysmal, he's terrible, he's something utterly new in America. Uh, at that level, there have been politicians like him, but not at the level of presidential candidate. Now, does he have a chance of winning? Most people now say, no, not, no chance, forget it. However, I don't know if you know who Nate Silver is. Yeah? Some of you are nodding your heads. Nate Silver, for those of us who 
follow the polls and are obsessed about politics and wake up in the morning, eyes half closed, turn on our phones to look at the latest polls. <laughs> Nate Silver is God. And Nate Silver has been analyzing polls and is the most, most effective pollster there is and studies that statistics. Nate says there's an 85% chance Clinton is the next president and just a 15% chance that Trump is. And then he says, but hang on, before you all decide it's all over, those are the same odds you get with Russian roulette. <laughs> you hold a revolver to your head with one bullet in it, you spin it. Would you take that risk? It's just a one in six chance you're going to die. Who would take that risk? That's the risk you face now with Trump. Odds are, odds are he won't win the presidency. Odds are you won't die from playing Russian roulette. Not with one spin. It's that serious. I'm for voting for Clinton without illusions. Without illusions. And I want to talk about a couple of historical precedents. I'm sort of a historian and published a couple of history books. I always look back. Let's start with 1964. The Democrats put forward Lyndon Johnson, not exactly our favorite person on the left, not, not even then. The Republicans put forward Barry Goldwater, an awful extreme right-wing nutcase who's never been a candidate, let alone president. And a young, dynamic, new left emerging in America, the Students for Democratic Society, decided, well, maybe we should, you know, we have to think of who we support. We hate Johnson. It was all the way with LBJ. We kind of catch it all the way with LBJ. And SDS came up with the slogan, part of the way with LBJ. Part of the way with LBJ. And that's how I feel about Clinton. Let me give a better example, a much more recent one. In 2002, to the shock of pollsters and everyone else in France, Jean-Marie Le Pen made it to the runoffs of the French presidential election. Jean-Marie Le Pen is a French version of Trump, only smarter. Um, when he was in the runoff, he was running off against Chirac, someone who everyone in France on the left center detested, a rotten, corrupt, right-wing politician who they all voted for with enthusiasm against Le Pen, and dealt a crushing defeat to Le Pen and the French fascists, a defeat from which they have not yet recovered. 14 years later. The French left understood that much as we detest Chirac, Le Pen poses an existential threat to the French Republic and to democracy. Or, I shouldn't say this, but what the hell. I'm in the Carl Liebknecht house. I can speak honestly about this. This house, this building, the men, and they were mostly men, who ran this party in the early 1930s, took a decision that in the fight against Hitler, with Nazism on the horizon, the Third Reich about to take over Germany and almost all of Europe, with millions of people's lives on the line, the greatest enemy the German working class faced was social democracy. Mm -hmm. Many of you will disagree with me. I'm not here to be popular. I'm just telling you what I think is true. This was a historic mistake of unimaginable magnitude, splitting the German left, refusing to form a united front with the Social Democrats, which Trotsky, to his credit, argued for doing. But the German sectarian KPD decided, no, the main fight is against our enemies on, on the left, because they're not really leftists. The result was Hitler came to power. The way, you would think we would learn from the experience of Chirac and Le Pen, the experience of, of, of Hitler and the communists, and we must learn those lessons. We must learn that in a fight against someone like Trump, you form alliances with everyone. Whereas Trump himself puts it. He says, Bernie has formed a pact with the devil, and Bernie is right to do so. So our progressive campaign for Clinton, for Clinton is different from the official I'm with her um, Hillary campaign. Because our support as Sanders Democrats is critical support, not unqualified support, critical support. Um, I'll say a word about the alternatives to voting for Clinton. They don't exist. You cannot vote. Many people say, I'm not going to vote. I don't like it. But that's irresponsible and petty personal politics. It's not. It's kind of a fight for which direction DLK is going to go in. And we just had the recent Berlin elections. DLK did well, didn't uh, Areas where young activists are located. Okay. The young, basically, Marx 21 activists and where they've been. This to me is not, it's not serious, responsible politics. If you're serious about changing the world, you vote. You vote for the candidate that you think needs to win, and to defeat the candidate, that must be defeated. Now, some people say, and we've done a poll of Sanders supporters, some people say they would support Trump or Johnson, the libertarian candidate. I think those are not serious positions and show a real lack of education, political education. Uh, Johnson and libertarians are a far right wing party, then 
only better than Trump in the sense they would legalize marijuana. Um, the only alternative that I hear that makes any sense at all, of course, is voting for Jill Stein and the Greens. And I should be clear about this. If you like Jill Stein and the Greens and you support their positions, you've gone to their website, you've read their platform, it all makes sense to you. I mean all of it. You've actually looked at it, not just that she seems nice, but that you know, she actually has positions you like. You should vote for her. Not only that, you should have backed her six months ago and a year ago. You should have built the Green Party two years ago and five years ago. You should build it in the future into a viable political party. I think America will be a healthier country if it had more political parties. I'm all for there being a big green political party. Um, but um, if you think that Jill Stein is Bernie Sanders in a dress, you misunderstand something about American politics. Jill Stein and Bernie Sanders have significant political disagreements, which anyone looking at their, their platforms. Hi, good evening. Sorry. Um, Anyone looking at that will know, and I'm happy to elaborate this, but I'd rather not at the moment. There are many elements of the Green platform that I personally take issue with and have written about, uh, and that Bernie Sanders would take issue with as well. Jill Stein is not Bernie Sanders. If you like her, vote for her. If you think you're voting for Bernie by doing it, you're absolutely not. Now, the main point, how many more minutes do I have? You have two more minutes. Two more minutes. Loads of time. Uh, I want to talk about the morning after, November 9th. This is only, you know, days away. It is important to preserve our unity as a progressive force in American politics and not to fall into the trap of accusing each other of betrayals, um, adventurism. Bernie Sanders has been called a traitor for endorsing Clinton. I think that's outrageous. Uh, we must engage in mutually respectful debate and be prepared to reunite as a left the morning after. Because our job, if Clinton is elected, is to keep her to her word and to do what the civil rights movement did when John Kennedy was elected. Kennedy was elected on a lovely platform, did nothing. He was uh, suggested to do it in the civil rights movement, mobilized Americans and their hundreds of thousands brought them to Washington. That was Martin Luther King's speech, I have a dream, was an attack on the Kennedy administration. It's exactly the kind of marches and demonstrations and movements we need if there's a Clinton administration. To put pressure on them from the left. That's the lesson, that's our, our um, history. And to build on that, and to build a proper left in America that can win control of the Democratic Party, that we came this close to winning this time, we will win next time. That's the task of the left. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. You said a lot of things about the Green Party, and Caitlin will say something about this. But first, we have our next um, invited person who will talk about something similar but not as radical, and that's Dr. Thomas Creven. Thank you. Well, I don't know. I don't know that it is less radical. You advocated a vote for Clinton. Essentially, I'm doing the same thing. Um, uh, first of all, let me apologize for being late. Um, I was not the only one who went to the Luxembourg Stiftung. We actually, there was a group of us. There's one. Um, and then we, uh, uh, at least I um, ran into a very shocked receptionist who was dismayed by the fact that I would get the, the heroes confused, right? How, you can, how can you confuse Luxembourg and Liebknecht? And so, um, sorry. But I think I was confused because it was the Luxembourg Saal. And so, yeah, that. And I haven't slept for 36 hours. I just got, got um, back to the country. Um, anyway, so I should, um, uh, in terms of full disclosure, I, sh I should say that I was in the Sanders camp. How, I'm not an American citizen, so I could not vote either way although maybe in a Donald Trump presidency um, for the next round, depending on just how much you pay. Um, but um, anyway, I, I would have been a Sanders supporter. I was. Um, I had the honor of working uh, for Bernie Sanders 20 years ago now as a congressional fellow. Um, and so I got to see up close and personal what, uh, what a heck of a guy he is. He's a true progressive. 
not a socialist, of course, um, but um, at least not in the European sense of the term. But uh, so my uh, position, of course, when I was asked to do this, I said, okay, someone has to has to sit there and be devil's advocate and actually um, uh, um, advocate a vote for Trump. But um, I wasn't going to be the one. <laughs> Normally, I would like to do this, but not in, not in in this uh, at this time. Um, this was before the sex scandal, obviously, but yeah, you know, we knew. Anyway, so my position is um, is essentially the same. You know, vote for Hillary. Um, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, um, so the lesser of two evils, um, preventing the worst from happening. Um, essentially, so there I stand with Bernie Sanders, who has fought a good fight. Uh, I think had he started six months earlier, he would have uh, had a, a much better chance because he was a bit late with the African-American and Latino communities, but um, it is what it is. And so essentially, um, you know, I'm, I, I, I would um, say what he says. We have to prevent Donald Trump. That's essentially Hillary Clinton is not going to be any worse than Barack Obama has been. So um, it is it's sort of more of the same democratic establishment, but it matters. It matters for a lot of people. Um, strangely enough, it probably matters a lot for people that vote Donald Trump. A lot of those um, are being helped by the fact that Bernie has pushed Hillary a little bit to the left um, and that she will advocate more for working families or whatever the term is that is used right now. Um, but, um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is... Um, there is um, what is called strategic voting. So if you are a progressive and you think you want to signal that, I think you can do so in those situations where Hillary Clinton is not going to win anyway. And so um, I don't know, actually, I don't know a whole lot about the Green Party candidate. I remember the time when this was a very contentious issue. You all probably remember it also. I have discussed it when Ralph Nader, uh, who came to a similar event many years ago, um, and to Berlin, when he ran and um, it, some argued stole the election uh, from Al Gore, which I thought was nonsense. He has every right to present himself as a candidate, as does the Green Party candidate now. And if people feel um, they want to signal a strong support for a progressive candidate, um, someone who is not a mainstream Democrat. Uh, obviously, they can't do that uh, for Bernie Sanders right now, so they, they might want to uh, give the vote to her. However, I would strongly advise not to do this in situations where it matters, because um, I go back to the Bush-Gore election. Um, we found out that in foreign policy, it certainly mattered, um, you know, you can't rewrite history, but I, I don't think Al Gore would have had any reason to attack Iraq, so we would be in a very, very diff different world today. Um, and then, as I already mentioned, uh, it does make a difference for uh, regular folk, for average, for the average Joe. Um, it does make a difference whether George W. Bush is in the White House or Donald Trump or any other Republican or a neoliberal Democrat. Um, in the end, they're going to be a, a little bit better, and um, that's going to make a difference for some people. Um, finally, I think, um, even though there's talk now that the Republicans um, might have, Trump might have sort of negative coattails, and certainly he's, it looks like he's going to bring the Senate majority down for the Republicans, but um, they're going to probably keep the House. The Republicans are probably going to hold on to the House. So um, it, 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 we're in for disappointments, as we were with uh, Barack Obama. Um, all this talk of, at the time, change and hope, when I hope was Clinton, right? So it's always the same. So during the campaign, they try to campaign left, 
and get people's hopes up, get people's expectations up. But it's a disappointment trap because the American system is what it is. You need a lot of different players to make something happen. And right now, uh, and that is the, the more serious problem as to, um, you know, how, how uh, Hillary Clinton is most likely going to win. So this, in a way, is moot, the discussion. She is going to win. Um, having said that, there is a key discussion there. The Republicans, as, divi as divided they are, they are um, very much um, um, committed to preventing anything progressive from happening. And, as you know, keeping a majority in the House will do just that. Um, Grover Norquist, uh, one of their main strategists, anti-tax guy, said, um, we just need the House to govern because what we want is status quo. So if we can block everything with the House, we're fine. Um, so that's the one thing where down the ballot there are more interesting choices to be made. Finally, the... Um, the m much more important issue is, what can anybody do who has any idea how to move away from this horrible polarization? Uh, some call it tribalization, where we've been witnessing this now, not just Donald Trump seems to live in an alter alternate uh, uh, universe, but a lot of his supporters too. Um, how, how did this happen? And what can be done to overcome this um, when you find that um, Democrats for so long have had a condescending, condescending uh, attitude towards the working class, and particularly, and let's just say it, particularly white male working class uh, people. Just get an education, go to school. Uh, it's not our fault that you, that you can't keep up with the times. So these guys, they're, um, yeah, they're, they're out of it. Uh, they're disaffected. Um, and now they're doing things that are, that are crazy. So can Hillary do anything about this? Um, certainly not by herself. So again, um, my position would be vote for Hillary when it counts and vote for whoever progressive you like um, when it doesn't. And now, Caitlin will talk more directly about the possible green <coughs> revolution. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Good. Okay. So, I'm Kathleen. I am from Pennsylvania, which is a swing state. And I am voting for Jill Stein. And there are a few reasons for that. I think what's important to note is that there were a few assumptions made, or statements made, and I think we have to critically analyze these. The first one is that Trump is a fascist. The second is that voting Clinton would stop Trump or Trumpism. And the third is that the Democratic Party can be taken over. These are the three assumptions that I take issue with. Now, we stand at a really critical moment when you think about the state of the United States. I mean, it's breathtaking when you consider the effects of neoliberalism on the American working class. Mortality rates are rising in the United States for, for a particular um, group, whites, um, white men, white women, opiate abuse, um, and suicide is going up. Maternal um, mortality rates are going up. Um, and of course we have the prison population, which has just been on a constant um, rise. Income inequality on a constant rise. I mean, when you look at these graphs and you begin to see a picture here of extreme income inequality, um, where the wealthy have so much and the poor have so little, um, it's quite stunning. 
And I think that we have to be really honest about the state of um, the U.S. working class. There's police that are able to brutalize and murder people, and they're not held accountable. And everyone is seeing this. I mean, these are the things that we should really uh, be talking about. And there are Native American activists opposing the pipeline that's going through their sacred grounds right now. Where, where is the discussion on this? We've got Obama, who is basically the deporter in chief. He's deported more immigrants than George Bush. And, of course, extrajudicial killings abroad with drone attacks. This is, you know, anonymous um, assassinations that are happening. So I think we have to be really clear, and I didn't even get into all of the, um, well, basically, okay, I'll just get into it. I mean, there are, there are many things here. Um, important, important to note is that we've got basically uncritical support um, for Israel. There's just the agreement given that Israel's going to get $38 billion, no matter um, what human rights abuses um, are. Uh, um, basically, Palestinians are, are uh, what can I say, are enacted against Palestinians. So we're kind of at a critical juncture here. And I think that that's where, how we have to think about it, that our task is much, much bigger. And that Obama has not been um, the hope and change that I think many of us wanted to see. Um, and people are looking for something different. And I think that's where Sanders came in. And Sanders was very good on particular positions. Um, on domestic, he was very good, $15 minimum um, wage. We've got universal health no, We don't have it, but advocating for universal health care, um, against the free trade deals, and all of that. Internationally, he wasn't as good, and I think that this was a weakness, really taking on um, the broad militarization um, and the way in which the U.S. has remade the Middle East. And so I think that we really have to um, examine that. Now, I'm not looking for political purity, but I am looking for a bit of honesty. And I think it's important to note that Hillary Clinton does not act in our interests, and, and that we know, and other, the other um, speakers have, have mentioned this. But Hillary Clinton is a, a ruling class candidate. Well, what does that mean? That means that basically everybody's um, behind her. She's got Robert Kagan, the neocon and architect of the Iraq War. Um, she's got millions of dollars in donations from J.P. Morgan, Chase, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, etc. Pharmaceutical companies, private prison companies. Okay, so this is um, <laughs> this is well known, and I don't think people would would disagree with that. But the point is, can we really stop Trumpism with Clinton? And I think that that's a no. There are a few reasons for that. Clinton has overseen, basically, the destruction of the American working class vis-a-vis -vis her husband's policies, which she supported, and as well, certain actions um, that, that she supported. So, obviously, her husband, we're talking about the destruction the having of the welfare rolls, we're talking about the deregulation of the financial industry, um, and of course um, the really gross um, expansion of the, the prison industrial complex, which really has, it, it's hard to state the effect that this has had um, in the United States. So I think that, that that's important to note. What does that mean? She supported these particular trade deals or these particular anti-working class policies, policies that have affected people negatively. Therefore, people want an alternative. This has kind of been shown in two ways. One, for, with Sanders, um, on, on one hand, who's really a positive alternative, and then Trump, on the other, who's the negative um, alternative. When you remove Sanders from the, from the um, equation, or Jill Stein, or any other left opposition, you're only left with Trump. And I think this is really significant. Um, that Clinton, of course, um, represents what is already happening. She represents the status quo, and people are not happy with the status quo. And when there isn't a left alternative, there's a, a right 
alternative, and so Trump is able to um, pitch himself as that. Now, once Hillary Clinton gets into office, as I'm sure she will, we can imagine what's going to happen. We know that Trump and all the Republicans will come after her day one with a scandal, um, and the Democrats will be told, and Sanders, I'm sure, will tell them, and, and Democratic um, pundits will say, it's time to act strategically. And then the midterms will be just around the corner, so we better keep focusing on the main enemy. And then the Democrats will lose big in the midterms because they've done absolutely nothing to help most people. And then it'll be time to start getting ready for 2020. You get the point. We've heard the argument before that Republicans are fascist. And it would be interesting to think about if it wasn't the same argument that we hear every election. What does that do when we say that? There are a couple things. One, I think it's a sloppy historical analogy. Two, I think it really overestimates the um, social forces uh, that are involved in fascism. I think also it overestimates um, Trump's power. And it makes us somehow passive victims that we would somehow just allow um, Trump to, to, if he were elected, to come in and then we just kind of give up and roll over. That's not the way it works. And I think that that's important to know. What is important to know, regardless of who wins, we need to be ready to fight both versions of who's in office. If it's Trump, we kind of know what that will look like. That will be straightforward. If it's Clinton, they'll be, they'll be, it'll be a bit more interesting. And I think what's important to note here is that we need to carve out a positive agenda that we are going to fight for. And it doesn't just start November 9th. I mean, we need to be calling out the things that we see now. And it is wrong. It is wrong for um, the Democratic uh, National um, Committee to tip the scales on, uh, in favor of Hillary Clinton. That's undemocratic. And yet, Sanders has said nothing about that. That's what lesser evilism does. The emails have come out that have shown that everything that Sanders was saying about Clinton trying to smear and destroy the campaign is true. And there's nothing, he's not going to say anything about it. Because that's the logic, is that you have to accept the Democrat or else you get the Republican. And of course, the problem is with that, is that we, we're stuck with terrible policies and we have no way to defend ourselves. That's kind of the history of um, neoliberalism for the past 24 years. And so our case is... We've got to be strong on this. We need to build an organization that will oppose Clinton and that will oppose Trump and will oppose anyone who's enacting anti-working class or racist policies. And I think right now, that's the Green Party. It's not perfect. People will say, oh, it's not serious. Have you tried to get on the ballot as a third party member, as a third party in the US? Do you know what it's like to try and get someone? You know that I, was, I petitioned for Nader in 2004 and I was spit on? That's what it means to, democracy is in the US. It means less choices, not more. So we need to be really serious. We have to build an organization that begins to project what we want to see. And I don't think the Democratic Party can do that. I think that everything that we saw with the convention and all of, 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 of Hillary's um, anti-working class positions, all of that shows us that that is not our party. We need to create our own party that doesn't accept corporate donations. This should be like the basic. You think that these bankers, pharmaceutical companies, private prison, uh, companies, you don't think they're not going to come? They know exactly what they're doing. And we need to build an alternative to that, not through that, but separate. So this is what I would say. The system's already spoiled. It's highly undemocratic. And we don't owe our votes to anyone, especially not someone like Hillary Clinton, who's profited off of the destruction of so many. There's no way for someone who marched and organized against the war in Iraq, when, you know, how many years ago are we now? 13. There's no way I would ever turn around and vote for someone who enabled the destruction of that country, encouraged sectarian division and a civil war, 
and, and, and created so much destruction. How can we, as on the left, advocate for that? We need principles. And yeah, we got the entire weight of the liberal establishment on us. That's fine, because we need to start building something positive, and we've got to do it. And there are lots of good things happening on the ground um, among social movements, whether it's Black Lives Matter and boycott, divest, and sanctions starting to make links, if it's the um, pipeline demonstration that's happening, if it's the fight for 15. Hillary Clinton is not the answer to Donald Trump. It's these social movements. And Hillary Clinton is not supporting these social movements. She wants to kill boycott, divest, and sanctions. This is part of the, um, the shared policy between Netanyahu and Clinton. So for us, we need to see ourselves as building a positive alternative that's independent, that's open on principles. And I'll use a historical um, example just to wrap up, and that's the um, abolitionists in 1840 who ran the Liberty Party because both parties that were running were in favor of slavery. And of course, they didn't win that election. But 1840, 1848, we begin to have the nexus or the kernel of something that becomes much bigger. And I think we are at the cusp of something very big. And you can see it in, in what happened with the Sanders campaign, and you can see it with the growing social movement. Things are about to get very big, and I think that we want to be um, building that, and that that has to be our main task. Thank you very much for listening. Now we're going to open the discussion with the public, and it will be really nice to listen uh, to, uh, to hear one opinion from the European perspective, because it's been a very followed election in Europe, and it would be like a nice way to connect our, or unite our fights. The micro is there, in the middle. Yeah, please. Hi, um, still, um, active by the, the international group. By the way, if anyone wants to know about coming meetings, we're just sending a form around where can we do an email address. I want to take on something that Eric said, the slogan of the SAS in the 60s, half the way with LBJ. Let's talk about the situation we were in then. Eric said, we just had Martin Luther King having I have a dream, a dream speech. We have the civil rights movement in the south. We have Muhammad Ali, who had just been jailed for opposing the Vietnam War, saying no Vietnamese ever called me nigger, and you have the beginning of the movement against the Vietnam, Vietnam War. At that time, Johnson stands for election as the peace candidate. The, the left falls in behind him and says, this is our man, this is the person who's going to bring change. What happens? Johnson escalated the war massively. The bombing of Cambodia, the bombing of, La uh, of, of, of Laos, the change in what happened under Johnson's presidency for the, the Vietnamese was, was dreadful. The left was um, in a very difficult situation because it was their man who was doing the bombing. But they took a few years to be able to reorganize, to be able to build what was eventually a successful movement, which took 10 years, eventually a successful movement, movement to, to stop the war. But because they have put their eggs in the basket of, of Johnson, and not in the basket of, of, of organising separately. They were wrong-footed, and for a couple of years, the, uh, the anti-war movement suffered, suffered as a result. Let's look at what's happening now. Whoever wins the presidency, Clinton or Trump, the USA is going to need a very strong anti-war movement. War, we are going to see more war, we're going to see more attacks on the, on, 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 on the Middle East, we're going to see more drone attacks, which were uh, which had following on from the peace president of, 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 of Obama. And unless there is a significant organisation in the USA against that, then, uh, then, then the whole world is going to suffer. How are we going to do that best? Are we going to do it by saying, okay, the solution lies 
inside the Democratic Party, inside the woman who has already supported countless wars, or do we say, we want to start organising separately, we want to look at what Black Lives Matter are doing, we want to look at the street actions, and look at Occupy, and the start of the anti-war war movement, we have it. Jill Stein is not going to win, but there is going to be a big difference as to whether she gets 2%, 3%, or whether she gets 5%. For the self confidence of the people who are going to stop the wars which are going to follow from the next president, whoever, whoever, whoever ever, ever wins. I've followed American politics for decades here. Every four years, there's the same argument. Of course, we need someone alternative to the Democrats and Republicans. Of course, we hate the Republicans, we hate that the Democrats are no answer. But this time, we've got to, all, we've got to vote Democrats because this presidential candidate is too bad. It started, with, in my experience, it started with Reagan, it started before that, Goldwater and before that. For me, it started with Reagan, Reagan, then there was Bush, then there was another Bush, now, now there's Trump. We cannot say every four years we will postpone our, we will postpone our struggle until we get until somehow until the Republicans put a nice candidate. The Republicans will always put a nasty candidate, but it's up to us to organise about both the Republicans, but also the neoliberal and war and Democrats as well. Is, uh, one question, and that is, uh, Neil Clinton is advised by Henry Kissinger and John Necrofonte and mm -hmm. other neocons. She is supported by them. Mm -hmm. So, and she's obviously the war candidate. She's supported by the army industry. So she's supposed to speak for the Democratic Party. And Eric, you said uh, it's a very progressive platform, and uh, it's obviously correct. But what can we expect from that? And from the European or from a German perspective? I'm very afraid that Hillary Clinton will start World War III, and it will happen in Europe. I, I think that's, uh, from, from my perspective, it, I get the impression that Donald Trump is on the left side of Hillary Clinton in terms of uh, foreign relations. So, what do you think? I will second that motion of what he said. There is, as ridiculous and as crazy as Donald Trump looks and is, I don't think she's a good alternative. There's progressive and Clinton just don't work together. I'm sorry, it doesn't sell for me. I'm sorry. It just, I think there'll be more war and they'll have problems with that with uh, Trump on another side. They're dangerous in their own way. So there's got to be something else. Even though the TV didn't show us there's something else, it's there. It's there. I don't know. It's not. Something was very clear that everybody up there is a leftist, that we're split on this question because it's a very, very difficult question of what to do. I said to myself, I could never vote for Hillary Clinton because of what's already been mentioned. Libya, Syria, the danger of World War III is the biggest danger in the world today. I could never vote for her. But um, with Trump, uh, his position is unclear because he perhaps has no position. His position is that which he likes to hear uh, to please his audience. But of course he has a party in back of him which is extremely right wing. And for this reason I've come to the fear that perhaps Trump is really a, a danger, a, a, a real danger of a, his fascist mob behind him. And this make, brings me in doubt uh, uncertain of myself. By the way, before I say anything else, I want to uh, point out about the German question that, that you raised about the, uh, the communists and social democrats here. It's nothing to do with this question, really, or only indirectly, but it's not quite complete, uh, <laughs> true, because right in front of this house, it was the communists on the eve of the Nazi takeover who had 100,000 or whatever it was, people demonstrating. They were the main force against Nazism, although they did make mistakes, certainly, as you mentioned. However, that's nothing to do with today. What I, what I have thought over, therefore, is I'm afraid of Trump in a domestic field. I'm desperately afraid of Clinton in the international field, but also in the national field, as many have said, we can't trust her supporting this progressive platform, uh, just as no Democratic Party in the past has ever done it. And I say we can't really support or, or trust the Democratic Party. I have no real hope that the Democratic Party can be reformed. However, 
It has millions and millions of members who have, or supporters who have to be won. And therefore, it should not be an anti-democratic party fight. We have to win those people. However, we need a new movement, and there we all agree. We need a new movement after November 8th of, of all these forces that you mentioned. I don't believe it can be within the Democratic Party, but give it a try. I mean, we try to win in, in every candidacy where the Democrats have a fairly decent person, we should support them. We shouldn't have an anti-Democratic Party platform. Uh, I agree on that, but as I say, backing Hillary Clinton who's had such a, who's really a danger for the world. She's been worse than Obama in every foreign policy question. In, she was all for Libya, marching into Libya. She was all for this red line business in Syria where Obama was wavering. She was always to the right, always pushing harder in Ukraine. In every situation, she's dangerous. However, Trump could really be a danger. And therefore, I'm grateful to say where I vote, in the state where I vote, Clinton is a sure win, so that I don't have to have any kind of conscient, uh, guilty conscience <laughs> to vote for Jill Stein. For you. And that's what I'll do. In the hopes, or despite of any, there are, of course she has weaknesses, although her position was better than Sanders, I think, in every question. Um, uh, Sanders was a very good position, and extremely courageous in foreign policy, too. He didn't go as far as she did, but considering the situation, he went much further than anyone ever thought, uh, especially compared to Hillary Clinton, who's, who's all for Netanyahu. She's a big fan of the first person she's going to write to the White House, for God's sakes. <laughs> and, and so I can't really vote for her. But I'll admit that Trump is dangerous, and therefore I'm grateful to vote in a state where I can vote for Jill Stein with a good conscience. <laughs> Hi. Uh, uh, all right. So I guess my thing to add would be like uh, you said that we uh, we pretty much know where we'd be uh, as the left versus a Republican, and it'd be more interesting under Hillary. But I I'd like to point out like the only time the only reason we're having this conversation right now is because we've had eight years of a Democratic president, and we've been able to see that what they propose that they stand for, like universal health care and free college and what have you, when, it, when the rubber hits the road and someone within the Democratic Party says they stand for these things, that a significant part of the Democratic Party doesn't act on them. Well, that's the reason why we're having this conversation. That's why Bernie did as well as he did. And, um, and, and yeah, I mean, you read the laundry list of stuff why Hillary is awful, and uh, and and how the DNC like tipped the scales. But even with that, we we a guy who calls himself a socialist wants 22 states in America. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, I mean, you grew up in Pennsylvania. I'm, I'm from Texas, and. Uh, I wasn't assaulted for uh, saying that I was campaigning for a socialist, so I think that means something. And um, I would just say that, yeah, we need we need to build this movement, and I think definitely like have the the most of it outside the Democratic Party. But I really just the way the system is set up in America, it would take something that we haven't seen in about 150 years uh, for a new party to take control in the way that the Democrats and Republicans have because of the first past the post voting system. So I think where our efforts should be is on uh, primaries up and down the ballot. I have friends in Austin uh, running as Democrats for uh, city council seats and uh, uh, community college commissioner seats and what have you. And Honestly, I know I think Hillary is going to be a one-term president, and the next Republican is going to be someone who can get the same constituency as Trump with the racism, but also won't be a flailing dumbass and uh, won't have tapes saying how he likes to grow up women. So that's what we need to look out for, and uh, and that needs to start as soon as possible. <laughs> so, okay. uh, um, what state do you vote in? New York. Aha. Uh -huh.
So some of us here have to do your dirty work, right? <laughs> you get to vote for Jill Stein. We have to vote for Hillary in order to prevent the Democratic state from tipping over to the Republicans. Somebody's got to fulfill that Nate Silver poll, right? Exactly. Don't we? Otherwise, you're going to have a guilty conscience. And I'm surprised how much conscience plays a role here, where in other aspects of life, we really look at the consequences of things. We don't worry so much about our clean hands. Right? We don't think so much about, will we sleep really well? We think about what effect our actions are going to have. I see the argument about the very, very safe states, California, Maryland, maybe New York, Massachusetts. But um, I think it's taking a risk. Bernie won, was it Michigan, when Hillary was 22 points ahead. Nate Silver's prediction. And Bernie won the primary. And we were talking just like this the day before Brexit. Nate Silver didn't predict Brexit. I, I read him every day, too. But, um, you know, voters' remorse is a real thing. And I think I've been voting longer than a lot of people here. And if you're getting ready, those of you who are really voting, who are eligible, I would think twice about the actual consequences of the act. By the way, if anybody's from Maine, voting in Maine, there's a proposition on the Maine ballot. And it says, we want, as in San Francisco, as in a lot of places in the United States, ranked choice voting, instant runoff voting which without changing the whole system, because that would take another generation or two, it actually allows the Green Party, the Working Families Party, the Social Democrats, to have an effect on the vote. To me, it's backwards to vote for Jill Stein now. I would be home campaigning not only in Maine, where, where I'm not from, but in other states, to get that, at least in my state, changed. And that doesn't take the constitutional amendment or anything like that. and that I actually think this event maybe has changed my position on the election. Um, but my question is, what if you aren't voting because it's not that you don't like either candidate, um, but rather because you don't believe in representative democracy and you don't think there should be a president, any of these people should be president, ever. Um, and you think that even if Jill Stein did by some miracle win, <coughs> she would inevitably turn into a war criminal as the system consistently produces war criminals. Who do you vote for then? What do you do? That's my question. My name is Michael. I'm from John F. Kennedy Institute. I'm a student of American politics at John F. Kennedy Institute. To so Mrs. Um, Kathleen Brown, um, you said um, like the solution, like Hillary is not a solution to Trump. Um, I totally disagree. I don't understand how you can even compare um, Hillary. I mean, the messages Hillary has been running to the messages that Trump has been running. Um, if you vote for Joe, a vote for Joe, Joe Stein is a vote for Trump because um, in in an unconventional uh, election cycle, a small you know margin in polls could you know cause a problem for the Democratic Party, uh, which is uh, for example in two thousand um, in the year two thousand during the two thousand election, uh, Al Gore lost Florida and New Hampshire to top party candidate, uh, which could have been the other way around. I think Agor would have won. I mean, the election would have been swung to Agor if Araf Nader uh, wouldn't have won. So I would say a vote for Jill Stein would be a vote for Trump. Trump is a, a pink-skinned, misogynistic, sexist, xenophobic demagogue. Um, and 
Pertaining to the issue of immigration, which you criticized President Obama for, uh, we also forget that um, presidents can pass executive actions without uh, Congress passing bills or giving the president the opportunity to do whatever he, want, uh, he wants to do. Um, president Obama has tried to, you know, legalize 11 million undocumented immigrants, and Congress has been the problem here. So I think it will, it will be very unfair for us to continue to uh, criticize President Obama for departing a lot of people, and that's all I'll say. general question to everybody. What is your take on if either candidates do not reach the uh, 270 electoral college uh, votes? What is your outlook on that? Because there is a movement to deny both candidates uh, the 270 electoral college votes. Also, what is your out? My question to the Democratic Party is that um, you do know by the demographics that there are more registered independent vote voters than Republicans and Democrats combined. Now, the Democratic Party has alienated the independent voters, gone so far as insulting them. Now, we're using the big bag, Trump is bad, which I do agree he is. But, what do you, how do you expect the Democratic, or at least Hillary Clinton, to reach out to those independent voters because they are the deciding factor? We do know that the candidate has to carry independent voters. And with that, I am extremely upset with the Democratic Party, the DNC, that they cannot simply take responsibility for their actions. I was a Democratic, I am an independent right now, and I'm still deciding on what to do. I am registered in the state of California, but I refuse to stand by a Democratic Party that cannot be Democratic. So, what is your outlook on that? How do you expect to get the independent voters to back you when you have alienated them before the election process even began? That's my question. Excuse me, can I just correct the fact that I think this woman was wrong on? Uh, you can have a situation where a candidate doesn't get enough electoral college votes to win under the current situation. It's either a Democrat or Republican will win each one, so one of them has to win. But if they both don't achieve it, if, no, no, they, if they both don't achieve the president, it's not possible. It's not possible. The house no, it, it is possible. The house no, no, but okay, it's maybe it's it's we can leave this answer away. for the last five minutes. Of course it is possible. It just has to be another candidate. Yeah, Three or four other candidates. That's not happening. Wow. Well, yeah, it's not happening. Thank you. Unless but it's possible. Constitutionally possible. It's not possible under the current situation. Okay. Somebody has to win. Okay. <coughs> there's, a, there's a person who wants to speak. Um, so what the gentleman here raised was a really good point, and that I hear all, all the time. And maybe someone in the panel can maybe debunk the myth that voting for Jill um, would actually help uh, Trump win. Because when I read, I think this is so important, and, and someone needs to know their facts, and maybe you guys can help us as an audience, because that's people's fear. And you know, for me personally, I want to vote on my morals, and I vote on my fear. So what he is bringing up is so important, particularly where he goes to school. And, um, and it just, anyhow, so what I'm trying to say is that, isn't it true that actually the reason that um, or lost was because actually the Democrats were, a lot of them actually voted for Bush. So that is the reason why. So it wasn't actually that um, NADAR took away Al Gore's um, <laughs> vote. It was actually that de Democrats voted for Bush. This is really, really, really important to go you know, from myth versus facts. People talk a lot. So maybe you guys can help us. Um, hello, um, I just wanted to ask the panel um, if we could comment on Mike Pence. I feel like uh, there's a lot of comparisons between um, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. 
Um, but realistically speaking, Mike Pence will probably be calling a lot of the shots, and he is also absolutely crazy in the other ways. Um, so just to maybe kind of go to a couple points here and there, if we're having a foreign policy discussion on whether Trump or Hillary Clinton is worse for foreign policy, well, is it the question Hillary Clinton or Trump, or is it Pence or Hillary Clinton, or who are we talking about? Um, yeah, so I think we need to also talk about Pence and who actually will be doing the government. There's an argument to be made that um, once you've already elected someone like Clinton to office, I mean, they have no reason to give you anything you want. Like the progressive platform is clearly because she felt threatened from the left by the Sanders campaign. And the only way that they'll continue with the Democrats being persuaded to move up and support that position is that they feel feel threatened, they feel more threatened from the left than the right. They have to move that way to earn people's support. Um, so I just, I'd like to say that I'd be interested to hear uh, from the speakers who are promoting Clinton, you know, what, what the response is to that. I'd also like to hear uh, whatever response uh, you know, speakers promoting Clinton might have to um, well, that's sort of the rigging of the primary. Like, I mean, we have evidence for some of it, and there's, you know, less, there's some other really suspicious stuff that you can't prove, just like uh, evidence of consistent, you know, the election irregularities consistently favored Clinton over Sanders. And so, I mean, that all kind of creates an image, um, you know, that suggests that it may be difficult or impossible to reform that party, but, but um, you know, their elites and everything always kind of spin things. <coughs> So they go the, the way that other people want them to go. Um, um, so yeah, I'd be interested to hear a reply to that. Thanks. Okay, so this will be the last question. I, I have to close it and then we'll, we'll listen to the people who are talking for us today here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. My name is David. Um, I'm, I'm German, so I'm not quite good. I might um, uh, abuse you with my uh, apparent uh, German accent. Um, so I, I, try to, I try to be quick in this by uh, just uh, stop talking, okay? Uh, so, um, so I don't quite know where to start. I'm, I'm pretty worried about this election. It's, it's, I've been following your elections for quite some time, uh, at least a decade, and uh, I'm quite horrified by what's, what's going on currently. You, you've, you've got a, a candidate who's definitely a fascist. Believe me, I've, I've, I've looked in, into the history of, of my country. Every single portion, every, every, every shape, every single um, part of, the, of, this, uh, of this platform is totally fascist. From the, the uh, hatred for, for other, other people who don't look like them, who, who don't have his gender, who, who don't have his sexuality, who are poor or something, and, and this, this goes across the entire party. This, this, is, not, this is not the, the, the Trump problem, this isn't just Trumpism, this is the European problem. This is the GOP. Um, and I, I really am worried about this. So, if you are going to vote for the Jewish side, I please beg you, please consider giving up your word to me and for the <laughs> This is just, I'm, I'm really um, horrified by this party. And um, the second part is uh, what you said about, about movements. Is it, so, Lady was right, this is what you did, what's your name? Um, yes, exactly. Um, Kathleen. Kathleen? Oh, yep. Okay, sorry. Uh, you, you said something about movements. Yes, like the um, Occupy movement or the Black Lives Matter movement. Those are important, mm -hmm. yes? And uh, this gentleman said, that uh, the left needs uh, a moral boost. Uh, this side needs to get uh, 4% of the votes instead of 2% because uh, the left just won't uh, do these movements anymore. I, I don't see that. I'm, I'm sorry, but, but uh, you've got ideas, you've got uh, um, ideas, you want to move things, uh, and if you vote for Hillary, this, this, is, this doesn't mean to you, you, you can't uh, do any movements. You, you, you could sit. Protest against uh, against uh, this inhuman justice system where black people are killed on the, on the street, 
uh, police officers who are held accountable, you can still do this. I mean, uh, if you vote for for Hillary, this this doesn't uh, stop you. This, this doesn't mean you have to go uh, to bed for the next four years and do nothing. Uh, I mean, um, it, it it doesn't end with this uh, this, uh, this election. You go to the voting box, put the the vote in, and, and then you can do other stuff. I mean, um, it doesn't mean you can you can't uh, uh, participate in any movements. And, and the other thing about the European Union uh, starting to work for work for free, please come. The, <laughs> the worst foreign policy policy blunder in the past years was the Iraq war. Does anyone disagree with that? No? Okay. So, and, um, yes, yes, but it was the worst uh, policy blunder. You agree with that. And, and, and the, the main factor that, that brought this forward was the gross incompetence and uh, stupidity of the Bush, uh, uh, Bush <laughs> administration. Yes? Yes, and Hillary participated in this. I don't, uh, I don't be this, but uh, as well as it, uh, the main problem was the, the incompetence and the stupidity. And I don't see that Hillary is stupid or incompetent. I see this with, with, uh, with Trump. I think he might start a war by accident. This is extremely <laughs> It's not the laughing matter. Uh, the Iranian sailors uh, insulting uh, the US Navy and uh, saying some, something to uh, which wanted to uh, the US Navy should, should just uh, think their votes. This might accidentally start a war. I don't see uh, how Hillary is uh, any kind of in the United So, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much that. Okay? Um, I think something quite significant happened this election. And I was quite stunning when I saw it. Um, it was when Hillary Clinton was giving a speech and um, a young woman, African-American woman, protested against her um, during this speech. It was in some sort of campaign. She was raising lots of money and she held out a banner. Um, and the banner, of course, was quoting Hillary Clinton's super predators comment that, um, she said 1994, and it, basically that was in um, reference to the racialized mass incarceration um, boom that came out of the crime bill. And what's important to note is that the Clintons came out of the uh, right-wing shift in the Democratic Party to appeal to white Republican voters. It's called the DLC and they adopted the rhetoric of the Republicans. So predators, the first person who said that, talking about criminals, was Ronald Reagan. Hillary Clinton says, calling um, young black uh, men super predators, they have to be brought to heel. So when I say that Clinton is not a way to stop Trumpism, what's important to note here is that there are ideological um, connections between Hillary Clinton and the Republican Party, which has enabled Trump. Clinton and her husband have done all sorts of things which have been really, really good for the corporate class and really, really bad for the working class. I think we can agree with that. There's a head shaking. Well, I think welfare reform was pretty bad and so was deregulation. Um, of Wall Street and bailing out um, Wall Street. No one was held accountable for that. Yeah. War in Iraq was pretty bad too. We can go through the list. But the point is here um, that we are at a juncture um, in which we can start to build something else. When this woman stood up against Hillary Clinton, I had never seen that before. Do you know how every election where the left is told, you can't challenge the Democrats or else. And here was this brave woman all by herself, challenging Hillary Clinton on the racist thing that she said, and the racist policies that the Clintons enacted. We have to be really clear about this. She can't reinvent herself as a progressive. If anyone has ever read this book, you know Hillary Clinton's role and Bill Clinton's role in creating a whole uh, mass, uh, mass incarceration uh, class. You know there are 6.1 million uh, felons in the U.S. who cannot vote because they're branded with the letter F. 
So I think that we have to be really clear on this. And, and what's important to note, we need an alternative to that, and that's what's beginning to come out. And these critical voices, Michelle Alexander is one, Cornel West is another. This is really important, and all the people who are upset at the Democratic Party, our job is not to tell them, yeah, yeah, you know, just later, later we'll demonstrate. Because we know that that later doesn't happen. When have you ever had the left, look, this kind of organized apparatus saying, yeah, we need to oppose the Democrats? Bill Clinton cut half of the welfare rolls. Where was the left? Hillary Clinton voted for the war. We were out there demonstrating against it. 77 Democrats voted for that war. And she's not held accountable for that. What does that say about our power? We are so far from holding the people who are in power accountable in a real way. We have to build serious organization, serious structure. What does that mean? What does that look like? Well, in the US, there isn't really democracy. What we call democracy is going and you get to vote. But what does that mean? Where do people go? Do they have places like this where they can convene and talk? Do they have structures? Yes. 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 What I'm talking about, what I'm talking about is independent outside of the Democratic Party that we have groups that last, that exist, to say this is our agenda and this is what we're going to do. Okay. Well. Okay, great. So then, okay. So if we say they're countless, great. So then where is our strength? Where are we winning? We have to do some serious work. Um, you know, if you think about, for example, um, Black Lives Matter is such an important social movement. And I think that we really have to confront the people who have um, militarized the police and been responsible for the way in which um, the police act. And this has not yet happened. So this has to be really what, what we're going for here. Um, with the spoiler thing, sorry, I don't buy it. Not responsible for George Bush. Did you know that Gore didn't even win his home state in that election? You run a terrible Democrat. The Republicans might win. That's not my responsibility. Our responsibility is building something that we want to see. And Jill Stein's platform, I think, is very good. We're talking about a new Green Deal, investing um, in sustainable energy and building uh, infrastructure around that, good jobs around that. Um, cutting the military base is really important. Um, creating a truth and reconciliation. Um, committee to deal with um, the way in which racism cuts through the very heart of the United States. So we're talking about building democracy in a much deeper way than going and voting every four years and then sitting back. We're talking about organizations that are going to hold both um, parties accountable. And if you're voting for that party and you support that party, why on earth would you protest against that party if there's always the risk of the Republicans coming in. And this is what we've seen again and again. So this is our task. It's not easy. We get a lot of abuse. But this is where we're at. And I think that actually there's quite a, a bit of uh, opening here when we do see the people that are starting to take on the legacy of the Democrats and say, yeah, we deserve better. And not only that, we're not going to get it unless we fight tooth and nail to get there. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I'm very uh, grateful for the uh, emotional appeal of um, my fellow German citizen because I was afraid I was going to have to go all Sarah Silverman on you. Um, I, might, I might do this intellectually, but at least I don't have to do it emotionally. Um, I think what happens is um, um, that the left gets so hung up on um, the Democrats that they f often forget, um, even looking at the past, what the alternative reality would have been. Think about that. Yes, Bill Clinton was not a good president. Um, 
But people had it better than during the Reagan and Bush years. That's what I meant when I, uh, uh, when I uh, said that things have consequences. So a lot of people here talk about, you know, voting their conscience, okay? Um, but voting your conscience will have consequences. Um, and then you will have to live with the consequences. And um, you have to accept that. Now, um, as I said in my opening statement, there is no blame. Ralph Nader has a right to run as a had a right to run as a candidate. Jill Stein has a, you have the right to vote for her, her in this case and him at the time. But these votes have consequences, and you have to think about these consequences. Now, my argument has been vote for vote progressive uh, if it can't hurt um, the country. Now, the country is not going to be. Um, it's not going to look like the progressive platform of the Democratic Party. I don't believe what's, what is said on that platform. That's politics. Um, and even if Hillary were to try, as I said, the Republicans are going to hold on to the House and they're going to be able to block a lot of things. That is politics. That is reality. That is the real world. The real world, by the way, is also... Um, the Green Party intra-politics. You know, I don't know anything about the Green Party in the U.S., but if the Green Party Germany is an example, you know, it's a regular party. They have their fights, their internal fights. You know how J Joschka Fischer got into power at the Green Party? You know, if you read German, I recommend you read this book. I mean, these are, not, these are crooks. Um, um, they're politicians. They do what they have to do to get into these positions. It's not going to get. It's not going to be any better uh, uh, in 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 a progressive party. There's internal fights. People hate each other. People disagree, and all that. You'll have that. That's real. That's the real world. I guess I'm going a little bit, Sarah Silverman here. Um, so, yeah. So the only way that I can make sense of this, I vote my conscience the hell with the consequence. The only way I can make sense of this intellectually is this position that is actually a very right-wing position, a position that is called worse is better. Because when, when things get worse, then people will finally realize that they need to have a revolution. Right? I don't want to live in that world. I don't want to live in that world where our votes make the world so bad so bad that then we have to have a revolution. Okay, I really rather deal with crook, crooks and Democrats, really. Um, so, um, hmm? Nobody here said that. No, no, no. That, that's, that was my interpretation. My interpretation is the only way I can make sense of this. I vote my conscience the hell with the consequences. That's the only way I can make sense of this is sort of if there's an underlying philosophical position that worse is better. So we have to like move it. Why not, you know, look in your leftist intellectual history. You'll find these positions. You, you, right? So you have you have an intellectual argument there. That can be a strategy. However, I don't agree with this strategy. More recently, we've heard this more on the right, in Germany, for example. But um, anyway. But the right in the US likes it. Why are all the right people going to Jesus? Um, that's not true. The reason why you're voting for Jeff Stein is that's the reason why you're voting for Jeff Stein. I knew this Okay, sorry, it's inside the finish in five minutes. I'm not saying that you said that, you're saying that's the only way that theoretically it makes sense to me. So, okay, okay thank, you. thank you for the motivation. Really, it's been very interesting for me, and I think I hope for all of you, but we are going to finish in five minutes. So maybe you can continue with this sorry about that. Yeah, in, yeah, some, yeah. in some public place. Five minutes. <laughs> Oddly enough, I get the last word. No, I don't, because we get to talk after this, right? Um, I counted 130 things said that I didn't agree with, of which I'll only have time to talk about maybe six. Naturally, the moment I do this, I'm going to piss someone off. So I'm going to take something one of you said and point out why it was, you know, stupid. 
<laughs> so there's just no way I can do this diplomatically, and I apologize to the people I'm going to be quoting, but whatever. And I'm going to save the best for last, so if you have a moment where you want to check your phone or you know, take a nap, do it now. At the end, I'll say the really important bit. Um, Donald Trump, not a fascist? Donald Trump is a fascist. Now, I can just say that and then move on to the next point, because that's how we've been having this conversation, right? I shout he's a fascist, you shout no he's not. But you can build a case, you can build an argument why Trump is a fascist. Because Trump embodies all the elements that we you know, associate with fascist politics. He incites against the press and the media. He incites with violence at his own rallies and encourages his supporters to be violent. He says that his first act in office, his first act, will be to arrest his opponent. This is un unprecedented in American politics. The blatant racism that we haven't heard since I was a small child. I'm very old. When I was a small child, politicians talked that way about people of color, the way he talks now, um, and so on. And then people will say, well, you people always say that. Every four years you tell us that we're going to elect a fascist. That's just patently not true. There's the expression in English, to cry wolf. You know what that means, right? If we cry wolf, we all the time we tell us it's a historic election, you must vote it, not vote for that fascist. But sometimes there, it really is a wolf. Donald Trump really is, and I do not always advocate you vote Democratic, and I will not always advocate to vote Democratic. And I voted for Ralph Nader in 2000, without shame. I've said that publicly. But Donald Trump is a fascist, and he, will, he is changing the political map in America. If you don't believe that, and you, you're happy to see him be president, you'll pay a price. Or some tiny political, historical points. Lyndon Baines Johnson was an awful president because of the Vietnam War, which no one at that time thought was going to become what it became. The reason why SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, the New Left, took a position of critical support for Johnson was because he wasn't alone. There was another candidate running for president, a Republican, who could have won, named Goldwater. And Goldwater was not in favor of sending American troops to Vietnam. He was in favor of using nuclear weapons in Vietnam. So there's a small difference. Johnson. Johnson brought upon a terrible war, which all of us think was a bad idea and was whatever. Goldwater could have ended the world as we know it with a nuclear winter. You wait. You say who would have been you supported? Um, I think Clinton will do it. Someone said, I'm going to talk about Clinton in a moment. Someone said earlier, I think, I think it may have been Kathleen, that, you know, have no illusions, we can't take over the Democratic Party. We can't take it over, we as the left. Well, I don't know what, what world you've been living in, but I, for the last, I don't know, 16, 17 months, have been working a campaign that won, as someone said, 22 states, 45% of the vote, took over the Democratic platform, almost elected Bernie Sanders president, came that close. Don't tell me we can't do it. Of course we can take over the Democratic Party. We came very close, and we're gonna, next time we're going to do it. I don't accept that. Um, I, I very much accept that. I don't want to backtrack on something I said. You know, not, not everything I said was right. I'm going to backtrack on something. Polls are not reliable. Nate Silver is a, in, acknowledging this. Not just the Brexit. I live in London. You know, we went to bed at night thinking, well, Brexit, that, that's finished. We'll be in Europe forever. That was a bit of a shock. The Michigan primary was a very good shock. Those of you who pay attention to politics outside of the United States, and I hope you do, will know that there was a referendum in Colombia last week that we were expected to win by a landslide for peace. Give a choice, peace, war. Was it 51% voted for war? I mean, people vote stupidly. It happens. And polls are not accurate. So if you're going to vote for... Um, Jill Stein, because the polls told you it's safe, that's irresponsible. That's irresponsible. It's that simple. Um, all right, the question of the rigging of the Democratic primary, you know, that actually we won. And I've been, you can imagine, being active in the Sanders campaign, I've been deluged over the months with arguments. No, he won California, and he secretly won this state. He won. If any of this were true, if Sanders was, if the primary was stolen from Sanders, do you honestly think Sanders would have shut up about it? What's he getting in return? Okay, no, you're entitled. I'm asking you a question. No, fine, I, I understand. But, it, but you're saying, you're saying Sanders knows this, and for whatever reason, he's decided to be silent about the election being stolen from him. You're entitled to that opinion, but I don't believe it's true. I believe Sanders accepts the reality that he came close, but no cigar. He didn't win. Let, let, let me finish the point. Well, I will not talk in here, please. I'd love to. I want to I'm happy no, to hear you, but I mean, she's going to stop me in a minute. They, they were the, the, the DNC, was the DNC were awful. We know that. We knew that before WikiLeaks. 
We knew before WikiLeaks. Yeah, we told the world before there was WikiLeaks. It's not, it's not right. What? Yeah. No, it's not right. The Debbie Wasserman Schultz should be in jail. Okay? Fair enough. And the Sanders campaign tried to get her defeated in Florida. Tried to get her out of Congress and out of politics. We failed. Not till the last week. No, I'm sorry, you're wrong. It's what Tim came over from the beginning. Um, let me continue. Um, people say it's the usual election year where you people, you know, come every four years, you always tell us this and that. There is nothing usual about this election year. Nothing. Not Trump and not Sanders. Sanders is not, was not a usual campaign. He was not a usual candidate. If you think, maybe some very young people think, we always have Democratic Socialists swinging 45% of the vote in America. No, you don't. Sanders is a phenomenon, as is Trump. It's a totally new year, and it's a new form of politics. Now I want to come to the important point. That was all minor. Um, this is where the handful of you who may still agree with me may want to leave the room, because this could get embarrassing. But sometimes I think you have to say what you believe and to say what you think is true, even if nobody agrees with you. So I'll say it. Some of you say Hillary Clinton, uh, no, this was, someone has said Donald Trump may accidentally launch a war. And others will cleverly answer, yeah, but Hillary would do so deliberately, right? Because exactly. right? Hillary is like, she's this neocon warmonger who is just itching to get her hands on some Middle Eastern country. Right? I mean, you believe this. I'm sure most people believe this. And I can make you all very happy by saying you're absolutely right. But you're wrong. I'll tell you why you're wrong. Because you'll, no, you give me the chance to tell you something you don't agree with. It's, you know, be a new experience for somebody. <laughs> um, the fact is, Hillary Clinton has been demonized by Trump and the Republicans for many years, and by certain people on the left, maybe a shorter period of time, often with the same argument. With the same argument. The lock her up argument. Put her in jail argument. She's some, somehow incredibly, much more corrupt than normal politicians. She's not. She's as corrupt as normal politicians. She's as she's bad. Normal politicians. She's, she's as bad, but she's not, she doesn't belong in jail. There's no reason to put her in jail. If, you, if you're trying to think of jail, 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 Vote for Trump because Trump will put her in jail. Just time will never have that opportunity. Trump has the opportunity to put her in jail. If you think Hillary Clinton is a mass murdering one monger, shouldn't be near anything. If you really want to defeat her, if you really think she's going to bring on a world war and occupy half of the Middle East and kill millions of people, if you really believe that, vote for Trump because he's the only candidate who could defeat her. I think she's been demonized. I think she's not that bad. I think Bernie knew this. And that's why Bernie said this from day one. So that's what I'm going to do. Final point. You still, There's have, been no, you still have two minutes. I have two minutes? I just need one. Um, you know, a couple of you have mentioned the fact, have introduced yourself saying that you're Germans. I will introduce myself. I'm a Jew. I'm not just a Jew of Jewish parents who was raised in a Jewish home. I'm a Jew who's an Israeli citizen, who lived a large part of my adult life in Israel, where I was an activist in the left and the peace movement and campaign for the election of left-wing governments. No one in this room, I guarantee, has done more to piss off Benjamin Netanyahu than I have, personally. <laughs> but I'm a Jew, and I'm proud to be a Jew. And I'm proud to be an Israeli citizen. My children and grandchildren live in Israel. Now, some of you believe that there should not be a state of Israel. You're entitled to your opinion. Bernie Sanders took the view, always, that Israel has a right to exist, that Netanyahu is a despicable character, his government is an obstacle to peace, the Palestinians is our homeland. Sanders has said all that. But he acknowledges the right of Israel to exist, as does Clinton. Jill Stein does not. This is a fundamental point why I would never accept it. As a Jew. So if some of you can get up and say, I'm a German, this is my view. I didn't interrupt you. If you can get up and say, as a German, I believe this and this and this, I can say to you, as a Jew, I believe this and this and this. I would never vote for a candidate who denies the right of the Jewish people to a homeland of their own. Never. And that's why I would never vote for Jill Stein. Yeah, I, I, can, I can give you two minutes because I think that's a very important thing uh, in I'll Germany. I'll one. Jill Stein has taken the view, it's in her uh, platform on her website, I encourage you to read it, that um, she believes that the United States should cease all, all aid to Israel, including military aid, which would strangle the country, and would end, I mean, Israel would not be able to defend itself without American aid. I think more, everyone agrees that were there no American aid, Israel would be finished. She's in favor of that. She doesn't support the right of Israel to exist. She supports the BDS campaign. Bernie opposed it. Bernie opposed BDS. Um, there's no indication at all she's 
any sympathy at all for the Jewish people that fight against anti-Semitism or the right to own. She's a Jew. What? She is Jew. Oh, so what? She's a Jew. She is. How can the Jew not have sympathy for the Jewish people? Ask her. Ask her how she can do that. She'll tell you. Okay. Yeah, I can I can take up first first Stein. So she's an anti-Zionist Jew, and there are many that exist. Many. Yeah. yeah. And the idea is that Israel is a colonial state that's founded on the expulsion of Palestinian people. This is not you know this is not crazy. So Jill Stein says um, that we need one democratic state in which there are equal rights for whomever the citizens are, and that it's not based on one's um, ethnicity, that there's an automatic um, democratic um, right that one has. And of course, that that doesn't, we know what's been happening with Palestine and the eating away at, of the Palestinian territories as the settlers continue. So she's for boycott, divestments, and sanctions, which is a movement that was founded from um, Palestinian civil organizations and has gained a lot of ground um, because it says that Israel is a state that is based on racial exclusion and it's an apartheid state. So I encourage you to look up more about boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Um, Angela Davis is for it. Cornell West is for it. Well, that's a different question. But on the question of, of Israel... Yeah. Okay. You have to think about weapons and Gaza. Just yeah. think about those two things. Weapons to Israel means Gaza. Yes. Okay. Okay. Are there any more questions for the audience about this conflict, the vote of Angela Davis or something like this? Okay. Thanks for coming to all the Americans, but especially also to all Europeans. And it's been something organized by. Yeah, you can. You can. You can tell something. I promised them I wouldn't mention this one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we used to be called for Berlin for Bernie and changed our name because we want to continue the fight and we want to continue to work inside and outside of the Democratic Party or Democrats abroad. We know very well that we cannot just be inside, but we do have a feeling that Bernie Sanders has shown he would never have gotten as far as he got if he had been outside of the Democratic Party because they that's why he ran as a Democratic candidate and joined because he knew that he could reach so many people. So don't put it all off. If you like Bernie and you like what he did, he had a strategy which really was working. We see it in a similar way. Anyway, our organization is new. You like support. Uh, Diego is in the back room. We've got some t-shirts and some buttons and a little sign-up sheet for our newsletter. And we're happy that you came tonight as our first event. Thank you. Thank you.